I, I got it on VCR, uh, but I believe CDs are available as well. It's, it's coming from Karst Environmental Research or something. I can find that. I think Florida Springs is one too. I think that's excellent. Thank you, John. stellar member of the science committee yes, so, uh, <laughs> and uh, we like to get together and drink beer and talk about things so it, uh, it covers many it covers a lot of ground anyway and uh, provides some good opportunity beer helps <laughs> okay Gretchen, you're going to have to help okay. me because i can't see okay that's all right you know it's the age So we're going to be traveling north of the, the border where John has been and uh, talk mostly about what's uh, going on in Georgia because that's where I've been working uh, primarily for the last 20 years on, uh, uh, on pesticide. Uh, well, pesticide Swanee River Basin, that one there? Yep. Uh, for the last 20 years or so at the uh, Southeast Watershed yeah. Research yeah. Laboratory. In there. there. Get that going. There you go. In Tifton, Georgia. And uh, I'm a chemist by training and have been obsessed with chemicals and contaminants uh, for off and on for the last 40 or 50 years. I've been counting up lately since I'm on the verge of retirement. So I'm forced to take stock of all of these things. And, uh, anyway, I'm happy to be here and tell you a little bit uh, about uh, what I've learned uh, over the last uh, 20 years or so about, pe about pesticides. Again, primarily on the Georgia side of the basin. And um, uh, I won't be saying anything about fertilizers. Uh, maybe that's for a time for another talk. So uh, let me see if I can advance here. Is it the page down? Do you, do you use the mouse. Oh, use the mouse. Yeah. And just click to go to the next. Yeah. Just left click on this and do it. Right oh, okay. So this might be open for debate. But uh, I want to uh, throw this out there and say that pesticides are very important regionally. Um, bottom line is uh, we've got climatic conditions here. They're hot and wet. Nobody would question that. We have a very long growing season, which is great. All of those factors contribute to very high pest pressure on most crops. Insects, diseases, weeds. It's, you know, it's a constant battle. Anybody who's had a home garden or if you're a farmer, uh, you know the story. Uh, disease and weed pressures are particularly high. Um, if we sum up what people use on farm fields uh, in the Swanee Basin compared to nationally on farmland, uh, uh, there's about three times more fungicides mm. that are used in this region than in other areas. Again, it's hot and wet, fungi grow, plants get sick. Uh, if you're gonna make it to market and sell them, a lot of times that requires the use of fungicide. Uh, we also have the distinction of being the home base, not necessarily in this basin, but not very far north, of the weed from hell. Maybe some of you guys know about this thing. It's called Palmer Amaranth. And uh, it wasn't much of, it's always been around, it wasn't much of a problem until it became, it evolved, evolution took place uh, very quickly, um, and it became resistant to the herbicide glyphosate. Many of us know it's round. Uh, and literally, it is a weed from hell if you look at its biology and the fact that it's resistant to glyphosate. Um, it has spread widely throughout the region uh, and actually across the country, not necessarily from here. Some other populations have evolved in other places, but uh, you know, it's a serious and very difficult and complex problem. This and many other weeds, many of them invasives. Uh, threaten the viability of uh, crop production throughout the region. So, you know, do we need pesticides? Well, you know, at least for now, probably yes, I would say. And again, it's open for debate. Um, so the reality, of, from my take on it, is integration of chemical controls into things like integrated pest management programs 
facilitates production of many of our crops, and in many cases they appear to be uh, essential for economic viability. So, what about pesticide use uh, in the Swanee Basin? They said, yeah, we've got a lot of pest pressure. Um, and so, I summed up, added all the pesticides that are used, or best estimates that we can come up with. Swanee Basin, we've got about 5 million pounds per year. Uh, nationally, about 800 million pounds per year. Man, that's a lot of pesticide. Um, and uh, perhaps some of it's misused. If we translate that into rates and pounds per acre per year, it, it provides a useful comparison between what's going on in the Swanee Basin as opposed to national. Wow. Bottom line is, pesticides are used very intensively here, again, because we've got very high pest pressure uh, and some important problem, agronomic problems to solve. So, what does this mean to the water? Of course, if pesticides get into the water, there can be some serious and deleterious effects, anything from um, you know, potential threats to human health, contamination of drink water, but fish kills, bird kills, whatever. So obviously pesticides are, have been and will continue to be a major concern uh, in terms of water quality, not only in the Swanee Basin, but worldwide. So here we have some pretty good news, remarkably. Uh, if we look at some of the long-term data, we have some in, our, in my lab in Tiffin, but I'll, I'll just talk today about the uh, the U.S. Geological Survey national water quality studies that are, have been done all across the uh, conterminous 48 states. If you look at all the sites that they studied in the Suwannee Basin, and you know, again, it's not a complete coverage, less than 4% of them had concentrations of pesticides in samples that exceeded threats to aquatic life. Whereas nationally, if you go to urban areas, about 70% of the sites they found cases where the water was toxic to aquatic uh, organisms. And nationally, agriculturally, about 40% um, had, uh, again, concentrations of contaminant, contaminating pesticides that exceeded thresholds where critters are going to get impacted. So what's that about? Of course, number one is good news. The important question, I guess, from a, from a land use perspective, is why is that the case? Well, number one, um, there are extensive areas of riparian uh, forest, and, and number two, numerous farm ponds distributed along and around the landscape that filter the farm field runoff before it gets into a ribbon stream. Again, this is largely on the Georgia side, not necessarily on the Florida side, as John was describing, in terms of the karst and where uh, the situation is very different geologically and, and hydrologically. Uh, this Google uh, Earth image I have up here uh, will just illustrate that. You see that green pipe running down through the middle there? That's this Tifton up there in the upper right-hand corner. And this Interstate 75, you see that green pipe? Well, that's the Little River. And you can easily pick it out at any map because it's bordered by forest. And that forest serves a critically important function in terms of filtering the water before it gets in the river. So what's the take home here? Well, we need to be advocating for protection and maintenance and ensuring the integrity of those buffers in our riparian forests. Because mm -hmm. they provide a critically important function in the landscape in terms of protecting water quality. The other part, somewhat of a hint, uh, uh, a mystery part, and, and one that we continue to work on in Tifton. I don't know, do we have a pointer here? This little red button on the point, which button points? No, there's no pointer. No pointer. Okay, well, you're going to have to just take my word for it. This is a little subsection of that previous Google Earth image, and if you look closely, you can see the dark outlines of numerous farm ponds across the landscape. This is a, there have always been farm ponds around, but this particularly in the last 10 years, farm ponds have exploded across the landscape um, for a lot of reasons. Uh, one of them being that uh, f folks uh, who put in irrigation systems, again, you can look out and see more and more pivots and travelers across the landscape, and groundwater is pumped and stored in those ponds before it 
is put into their uh, into the irrigation system. Well, those ponds also serve a very important filtering function, and we find that time and time again in all our studies. So the runoff gets into the pond, it sits there for a while, the bacteria take over, sunlight works, and you have substantial degradation and dissipation of the contaminants. Uh, of course, there are issues about the possibility of exposing wildlife to pesticides who contact those farm ponds, but nevertheless, the bottom line is in terms of protecting the rivers, farm ponds play a very important role in, in one that we're continuing to pursue uh, further in our work in Tiffin. Uh, now, all is not rosy. We do have some good news about the rivers, but I want to give you some interesting news about the rain. Uh, we did a study in Tiff County in a small, heavily farmed agricultural watershed, watershed and uh, we just published this last year. Uh, this is where we collect uh, individual samples of rain. Every time it rains, we send our staff out there and they bring the samples back to the lab and we analyze them up for a whole bunch of pesticides. Um, over on the far uh, left-hand side are some of the active ingredients we looked at. These are very commonly used. Uh, we've got toxicity endpoints, endpoint type, whether it's to invertebrates or plants. And the most important part is over here on the far end on the right side, percent exceeding. So that's the percentage of samples we collected that exceeded some toxicity endpoint. That's so, in the rain. That's in the rain. So, for example, in the case of the fungicide chlorothalonil, 21% of all of our rain samples exceeded a toxicity threshold. In the case of endosulfan, which was, was and I say, all I'm going to emphasize was, was a very widely used insecticide, 77% of all of the rain samples were toxic. So, now, rain doesn't, rain toxicity doesn't immediately in, translate into toxicity in the landscape, but it's certainly something to be concerned about, and, we have raised the flag about that. We'll see what kind of blowback we get on that. Uh, it's going to be interesting, but clearly we need to take into account pesticide contamination of rain as a possible risk uh, within our landscape. I just want to emphasize one good part of the story. This study didn't contribute to the banning of endosulfan, uh, but I want to tell you that endosulfan registration has been removed and it's no longer legally used. Um, here in the United States and much of the world, and I think that's a great story. The, the removal of the label and the ban was long overdue, mm -hmm. and uh, this type of study certainly illustrates that. How did they come up with those endpoint numbers? Well, those are from bioassays. So you, you do a, a, a either a static or a dynamic bioassay in the laboratory and expose organisms to different concentrations of these chemicals in water, and then you decide when you have. Uh, some kind of toxic impact that could be death <coughs> or, you know, lack of reproduction or, you know, a whole bunch of things, but it's basically a bioassay driven system and process. So I just want to say one more thing about pesticides in the air because this is coming up. Uh, it's going to start this summer uh, around here. You can't read that top part, but what it says is cotton which has been engineered to resist the oxen herbicides. These are oxins or plant hormones. And the two most commonly used oxen herbicides are the 2,4-D mm -hmm. and another one called dicamba. This variety of cotton, which is developed both by Dow and by Monsanto, has been approved for use and will likely be planted in South Georgia this coming growing season. So it's going out there and it's probably going to go out there uh, big time because uh, there's a lot of marketing effort to get that crop out there. Now, can you read these slides here? Um, it may be a little bit small here, but these were put together by a colleague in Tifton, Stanley Culpepper, uh, who we've signed this very well known, highly uh, respected guy um, in the weed science area. In fact, he was the primary discoverer of this weed from hell uh, that I talked about earlier. So one thing about these oxen, -like, oxen herbicides are is that there are many plants that are extremely sensitive to them. So Stanley has gone ahead and produced these two slides uh, for the grower community in the area when he goes around and talk, does extension talks. And he's talking about a visited, visual, visible sensitivity scale, meaning if it 
if the plants get touched by this chemical, are you going to be able to see an impact? And so you can see there's low, moderate, severe, and extreme, and again, there's the two different chemicals. But the extreme um, is pretty scary because you've got things that are sensitive to a dose rate that's almost a thousand times less than what you normally put on an egg crop. They, he's got less than 800 eggs, so I'll round up to 1,000. Um, so with 2,4-D, we've got cotton. So if your cotton hasn't been engineered to be resistant to these herbicides, well, it's under some threat for some drift. And you've got grapes, sweet potato, and tobacco for 2,4-D. Look at dicamba. We've got grapes, lima beans, southern peas, snap beans, soybeans, sweet potatoes, and tobacco. I wouldn't mind tobacco, by the way. And of course, some of the less severe. So there's a serious concern about these herbicides being used in getting in the wrong place. So here's the problem. Dicamba and 2,4-D are among the most volatile pesticides in use. Thus, drift in volatilization and deposition is a problem. People have been finding this out in the 50 years that these chemicals are being used. Now, the companies that are selling the resistant cotton varieties and soybean varieties have marketing less volatile formulations. So they've actually reformulated the products to make them less volatile. And that's a good thing. But it doesn't keep growers from using the less expensive generic varieties. They're not formulated and sold under these new labels. So that kind of all blew up last summer uh, in another part of the country, which I'll talk about. So it appears to be the case, um, you know, in the case of the generics use, uh, in a tragedy that occurred in Arkansas last year, um, here's some headlines that I saw a while back in the Wild Farmer. Pesticide drift leads to alleged murder. And indeed, this happened, sadly, um, in, in, in Arkansas. Some guys were arguing over a, uh, you know, whether or not your drift damaged my crop, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And one of them pulled out a gun and shot the other one. Okay. Well, of course, now he's in jail and waiting for trial. But uh, that kind of shows you the, you know, the, the potential severity of the problem and the issue. It isn't just the, the threat of murder. There's economic issues and, and a whole bunch of... Of, of other concerns. So I'll just close up here about that one, not to be too big of a fear monger. I uh, checked in with Stanley, uh, our expert in weed control, and so what would Stanley do? He said, well, I'll stick to with my statement that if I could stand on top of my high boy, now, I don't know if you all know what a high boy is, it's this big thing you drive through your cotton field and spray your herbicides with or your defoliants. Uh, and there was a super sensitive crop nearby, like peaches, tomato, whatever. And I could see them with my binoculars. Well, I wouldn't spray these chemicals. So it's sort of an interesting rule of thumb to these. Uh, and a bit of a challenge he's put out to some of the farmers uh, uh, in terms of adopting this new technology, i.e. the oxygen-resistant uh, varieties of cotton and or soybean, um, and the use of these herbicides. In an environment where we have a very diverse agriculture and the potential for severe consequences if the chemical gets in the wrong place. So uh, it's going to be an interesting summer anyway. Um, so, you know, maybe we all ought to be the eyes and ears on the ground to, to see what's going on there. Now, I'll stop there and uh, hold any questions. Do you think, um, I know there's, in Europe there's a lot of uh, people refuse to buy things that are uh, include genetically modified organisms. Does that get farmers' attention? I mean, do farmers feel like, because these are essentially genetically modified, right? Oh, abs oh, absolutely. So, I mean, that's how they become. Is there any uh, yeah. awareness of that here in the U.S.? Do you think they just figure Americans are going to buy whatever they can grow? You know, there, I, I believe there's a lot of awareness, but ultimately, I think there's a there's a bottom line issue attached to it. If you can use this product, and, um, and, and they're not yet seeing any pressure, is what I'm getting. Yeah, I don't think there's pressure. If you can yeah. use this product, and you can facilitate weed management, and uh, so we have sort of like uh, a uh, um, organic, we have like a boutique industry of growing things that are not GMO, that's organic. And yeah, I would say, I would that say, that yeah, that's an appropriate term for it. Uh, you know, I, I, unfortunately, hopefully, we're going to evolve and mm -hmm. as we become wiser and. You know, certainly the the story behind the Palmer Amaranth 
then the glyphosate resistance, resistance is sobering, right? I mean, that's the result of the introduction of a herbicide resistant crop, an incredibly intensive use of this herbicide, which made evolution accelerate. Yeah. Um, and so now we have a resistant weed, which is extraordinarily difficult to control. So uh, I guess I'll remain hopeful that uh, we get wiser as we go forward, but uh, there are, you know, there are economic pressures that drive this. That uh, I have to admit, I hardly ever yeah. buy things that are marked as organic myself, and like I've started doing a little bit more of it. I don't, I haven't thought of it in those terms about. Um, I don't know that there's enough um, that there's something that organizations like this can foster some more public. Well, I think we need to we awareness need to, to what you're doing in the market. And that yeah, market. I think that that's an important thing, and that's part of the educational process. And I guess why we're here tonight, and, and yeah. you know, try to uh, get the word out, word out, have a dialogue. Uh, part of this has gotten so complicated. There's like yeah. all these different, like especially when you're buying eggs. I mean, there's like there's about ten different stamps they put on them. I never know. <laughs> no doubt. No, yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. <laughs> Brad had a question. So in the same vein, um, there's a number of crops you can grow down here on a small scale that don't require pesticide inputs. Sure. <laughs> Would there be a role to try to promote, you know, the change in what we grow and what scale we grow them you know, as an alternative to, you know, this kind of uh, intensive? Well, absolutely. I mean, I think we need to argue. We need to advocate for that, you know, recognizing that there are massive economic forces out there that, you know, pretty much run the show. Um, that doesn't mean we need to be discouraged and go hide in our corners, um, but I also think we need to be realistic when we're looking at multi-billion dollar industries, um, that uh, the economic forces that drive them are going to be ones that are, are, are going to be difficult to change. On the other hand, the organic market is one of the fastest growing industries in the country. Um, and if you want to, you can eat pretty much all organic right here in Lowndes County or Tips County or nearby. There are CSAs, computer support, uh, community supported agricultures, and there are people like Brett or us who grow without pesticides. It's also worth remembering that this overuse of pesticides I guess I know you said it. it's always a matter of opinion how much use is good use or overuse. But my opinion, overuse of pesticides, that only really came about in the last 20 years. Sure, there were some pesticides yeah. used before that, but getting to the point where 90 plus percent of major crops are genetically modified seeds just doused with pesticides, that's in the last few decades. If it got there that fast, it can change that. John, I'm going to have to do, uh, we can go on that, but I'm going to have to challenge you on that one, because it's not the recent phenomenon. Uh, the, the, the genetically been... modified uh, plants are, but the, the intensive use of pesticides in agriculture have been going on literally, at least the, the, the standard chemical ones, for maybe six decades, at least post-World War II, and prior to that, there were all kinds of pesticides that we used, or even nastier and meaner, meaner um, uh, arsen arsenicals and, and mercurials, and you know. So there's a long history there, and we could go into it, you know, and argue late into the night. But, uh, uh, okay, let me narrow my point. We used to yeah. genetically modify seeds yeah. and require these now apparently require these particular pesticides. That is only in the last few decades. Well, see, they don't. They don't require them, but they they can be used with them in companion. You can grow those genet genetically modified crops without spraying them with those herbicides. And in fact, this, the, the, the goofy part of it is, and I'll just, I'll end here, I could go on and on, but the oxen herbicides have been introduced as a tool for weed management with genetically modified crops, but they don't really do a very good job of controlling the weed from hell. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the Palmer amaranth is relatively insensitive to the oxen herbicide. So introducing this technology isn't going to solve the real problem, which is that weed that became resistant, which is spread all over the landscape. You can see them growing like Christmas trees. Uh, 
you know, in the early fall when you look at them from cotton fields. So, um, I don't know, I guess there's some, I don't know, somewhat strange logic there, but, uh, you know, that's one of the, the things we're dealing with, and this is commerce, and this is the way things function in the U.S., and we as citizens need to be out here advocating and, and talking about these issues, and, uh, well, and hopefully promoting some solutions. Instead of call that for us, go out the solution to the Palmer Outrat. Use cultivator, plow before you plant, use cultivator for the weeds, plant where the cover crop gets way down. Well, yeah, no, but what about erosion? Um, okay, we could talk about that later. Anyway, Our time is up on this one. My time is way used up. <laughs>